Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel once again. So today I'm coming back with another horror book recommendations video. The last one of these I did uh, was pretty well received. So I figured let me, I've compiled a, a handful of more horror novels that I've read over the past couple months. So I figured uh, let me do another one of them. So I'll do it in the same format like I did last time. Basically I read the premise that is on the back or the inner flap jacket of the books. Uh, follow it up with like a little review and um you know let you know what i thought of the book and and how it was so without further ado let's get into it so the first book is boy's life by robert mccammon the year is 1964 on a cold spring morning before the sun cory mackinson is accompanying his father on his milk delivery route without warning a car appears in the road before them and plunges over an embankment into a lake some say is bottomless Corey's father makes a desperate attempt to save the driver, but instead comes face to face with a vision that will haunt and torment him. A dead man, handcuffed to the steering wheel, naked and savagely beaten, a copper wire knotted around his neck. The lake's depths claim the car and the corpse, but the murderer's work is unfinished, as from that moment, both Corey and his father begin searching for the truth. The small town of Zephyr, Alabama has been an idyllic home for Corey and his friends. But now, the murder of an unknown man who lies in the dark lake is tortured, soul crying out for justice, causes Corey's life to explode into a kaleidoscope of clues and deepening puzzles. His quest to understand the forces of good and evil at work in his hometown leads him through a maze of dangers and fascinations. The vicious Blaylock clan, who defend their nefarious backwoods trades with the barrels of their guns. A secret assembly of men united by racial hatred, a 106-year-old black woman named the Lady Who Conjures Snakes and Hears the Voices of the Dead, a reptilian thing that swims in the belly of a river, and a bicycle with a golden eye. As Corey searches for a killer, he learns more about the meaning of both life and death. A single green feather leads him deeper into the mystery, and soon he realizes not only his life, but the sanity of his father may hang in the balance. So, this book is basically... In a nutshell, it's a it's a coming of age story. If uh, if you're a nostalgic person at all, and I guess if you grew up in a smaller town in the suburbs, say, or or you know a farm town, um, you're really gonna relate to this novel. Um, you know anything with any sort of degree of nostalgia, I'm all over, uh, which is kind of what brought me to this novel. It is my first Robert McCammon experience, and let me tell you. I was uh, very happy with it. I, I'm definitely looking forward to read more of McCammon. Um, so the story had a lot of different elements to it. It had supernatural elements as well as, um, you know, racial undertones, which is pretty indicative of what's going on today. Uh, although it, it it is from back in the 1950s, I believe, which things were a lot different back then. But um, I mean, it was still interesting to read with everything that's going on in the world today in that regard. Um, it was a very good novel. Um, start to finish, it's it's pretty exciting. McCammon's writing style is pretty, uh, it's pretty dense, uh, very descriptive, um, very slow paced um, in terms of how he writes. But it doesn't mean it's a, a in a boring way, which uh, which is always good. I do recommend this novel um, to any anyone who loves reading horror. Uh, like I said, it was very versatile. There was a lot going on, and it was just a great. Uh, roller coaster ride with a lot of mystery and uh, thought the way he wrapped it up in the end was great. So thumbs up on this one for me. The next book is Touch the Night by Max Booth III. Stranger Things and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre unite to form a blood-soaked matrimony of violence and corruption. Something sinister is hiding in the small town of Percy, Indiana, and 12-year-old Joshua Washington and Alonzo Jones are about to find themselves up close and personal with it. After a harmless night of petty property damage leads to the unthinkable, the red and blue lights of a cop car are the last things these boys want to see, especially a cop car driven by something not quite human. Enter Mary Washington and Otessa Jones. Their sons have been best friends for years, and now Josh and Alonzo have been abducted in the dead of night. Worst of all, the local sheriff refuses to believe they're missing, leaving it up to Mary and Otessa to take the law into their own hands before a family of ungodly lunatics can complete a ritual decades in the making. Together, they will embark on a surreal and violent journey into a land of corrupt law enforcement, small-town secrets, gravitational oddities, and ancient black magic. 
So this book uh, is fairly new. I believe it was released last month from Cemetery Dance. Uh, I just finished reading this actually. It's the last one of this batch that I did read. Um, it was it was pretty good. Uh, very dark. If uh, if you're not exactly into, let's just put it this way, if you're into happy endings, this isn't the book for you. Um, this book doesn't really let up from the get go, and um, you know doesn't really leave you in a good place. I'm doing the best I can to not spoil anything here, um, but that's just about how how I can put it. Um, from what I've been reading, I, I like to read some reviews on a novel after I read it so I don't spoil myself on anything. And a lot of reviews online were saying this book could contend for um, a horror book of the year, the Bram Stoker Award, I believe it is, uh, this year. Um, it could be a nominee. So um, I highly suggest checking it out. It, it is a really good read. My first Max Booth experience, um, pretty good, pretty easy read in that regard. Um, you can you can get through it pretty quick. It's a page turner. Um, getting more plot related, it follows two kids, um, two black kids actually, who end up getting into trouble. And you know you would think that you know the police corruption and everything like that in the town um, leads them to being into more trouble than the petty crime that they ended up taking. But it turns out that uh, it's something inhuman that is posing as a police officer. So that's the supernatural element to it. Um, and really the story follows their mothers trying to get them back and having no help from the police department and everything like that based on their skin color. So it is interesting how um, the cultural differences uh, coincide with the actual supernatural element of the novel. I thought it was very interesting how we intertwined all that together. Um, but overall, it's it's a good read. And like I said, um, you know, the ending is uh, is interesting. And I'd like to hear what other people think of the ending and, and even their take on it, because the way I see it is they did leave it up for interpretation, but a good one here. The next book is Jaws by Peter Benchley. I'm not going to read the premise on this one because it obviously is a very famous movie and everyone knows what it's about. It's about a shark terrorizing Amity, a small town on the Upper East Coast um, in the summer. So uh, so basically I'm gonna talk about the differences, the differences between the book and the movie. Um, I love the movie, I've seen it countless amounts of time. It's one of my favorites. Um, so basically the major difference in this is that there's actually a love triangle between Chief Brody, Hooper and his wife. Um, Chief Brody's wife actually does cheat on him with Hooper, which I thought was insane because watching the movie, you would never think that was going to happen. Also, there was a uh, mob element to it as well. And, and um, the, the town mayor, I guess it was, um, in order to keep the beaches open and everything like that, was um, he was being influenced by the mob. Um, so it wasn't really his doing. It was more so external forces and the mob forcing him to keep the beaches open, putting people in jeopardy. So those were pretty much the differences. It's a really good read. It's a good summer read. Obviously, it takes place in the summer town and everything like that with the, the shark terrorizing everybody. The shark was actually secondary to uh, the plot of the book, which was interesting to me as well after seeing the movie so many times. But a good read. And like I said, a good summer read. So next, we're going to talk about three Dean Koontz novels. They're the first three Dean Koontz novels that I've read. So the first one is Dragon Tears. Police detective Harry Lyon is a perfectionist who likes his condo immaculate, his suits well tailored, and his homicide files typed error-free. To Harry's dismay, his partner, Connie Gulliver, embraces chaos, urging him to get in touch with the rhythms of destruction. But when Harry and Connie have to kill in the line of duty, the ensuing surreal nightmare makes Connie's cynical worldview seem all too accurate. That same afternoon, a hulking street person prophesizes that Harry will be dead by dawn, then self-destructs before his eyes. As twilight falls, Harry glimpses strange creatures in the shadows and finds his rational world transformed into a place of bizarre surprises and unimaginable dangers. As dawn ticks closer, Harry is caught in a whirlwind of terror that threatens to sweep away not only him, but Connie and everyone he loves. So that's the gist of this novel is basically it follows Harry and his partner, like the premise said, but also a homeless man as well as a... Um, I guess runaway single mother or a mother who's running away from her husband with their with their son who's kind of living out of their car and basically a stray dog who becomes a major character in this novel and it actually becomes pretty interesting how certain 
chapters or parts of chapters were written from the dog's perspective. So it's pretty hard to explain, but think about how a dog would think. It's very basic and he's only thinking about food and animals and scents and things like that. So it was pretty cool to read. Um, basically, there's this man, this ultimate evil who thinks he is evolving to the point of becoming a god, which is seems to be a common theme of the villains in Dean Koontz novels, um, at least the three I've read. Um, but basically, he can like manifest himself um, into different forms and appear in different places and wreak havoc on people's psyche and really, you know, mess with them. And that's what he's doing with all these characters. And, um, you know, these characters kind of realize over time that they're dealing with the same problem and they come together in different ways and end up taking them on all in the end. So this was my first Dean Koontz novel that I read. It's really good. Um, Dean Koontz has a, a certain specific writing style, uh, but I like it and I'm looking forward to learning, to, to reading some more of them. Um, and uh, like I said, the next two books are Dean Koontz as well. So let's get into it. So the next one is Night Chills. When Paul Annandale arrived in Black River, he expected to enjoy a quiet holiday, camping with his children, visiting with his old friend Sam Edison and renewing his budding romance with Sam's daughter, Jenny. Instead, he found a nightmare, the town ravaged by mysterious epidemic of night chills and fever that ordinary drugs don't seem to cure, old friends behaving in a strange and frightening manner. Black River had fallen prey to the experimentations of Ogden Salisbury, a scientific genius who, with the help of a power-hungry millionaire and a greedy Pentagon official, intends to gain mastery of the world by gaining control of the minds of the people. The frantic efforts of Paul and Sam to discover the key to his mania and diffuse the psychological time bomb he has planted in Black River before it is too late form the plot of a thriller that is sure to join the ranks of the best of Michael Crichton and Ira Levin. Ever since becoming aware of the power of the hidden persuaders, the subliminal urgings of advertisers, people have been suspicious of the possible uses to which such subconscious suggestions might be put. Now, in Night Chills, Dean Koontz has confirmed their worst fears by showing us the horrifying results of subliminal suggestion taken to its ultimate conclusion, total control of the human mind. So bri brilliantly has he woven together the strands of creative imagination and meticulously documented research, the resulting fiction is too electrifyingly possible not to be believed. So it tells you a lot right there. The book's basically about mind control. In a sense, this evil genius once again uh, decides to come up with this drug that's going to um, induce you to, uh, I guess, take in subliminal messaging uh, more freely or take it, you know, into account a lot more easily than if you weren't on these drugs. Um, so basically, he puts the drugs in the water of this small town um, as the people drink the water over time. Um, they're all susceptible to this, and then he ends up. Um, airing these like Sunday night movies that everybody loves with these subliminal messaging in them, uh, which basically turns him into their controller. Um, he's then, this guy was pretty evil. One of the most evil villains I've ever encountered in a novel. It was uh, pretty disturbing, some of the stuff he did at some points. Um, so this movie, uh, or this movie, this book, um, you know, I, I would say it's for a little bit more of an adult audience. Uh, based on some of those things. I'm not going to go into too much detail right now. Uh, but overall, it's a really good read. I think it's one of Dean Koontz's early novels, judging by how old this copy is that I'm holding right now. Um, but yeah, um, another good one by Dean Koontz. So uh, like I said before, I'm pretty impressed with the few that I've read by him. So the last one I'm going to talk about today is Intensity. China Shepherd is a 26-year-old woman whose deeply troubled childhood taught her the hard rules of survival and whose adult life has been an unrelenting struggle for self-respect and safety. Now rare trust has blossomed for China into friendship with the woman whose family home she is visiting for the weekend. A farm in the Napa Valley surrounded by vineyards and hills, which China can see from the guest room window where she sits at 1 o'clock in the morning, fully dressed, unable to sleep. Suspicions she learned in childhood still make her uneasy in unfamiliar houses, even this one, where her closest friend is sound asleep down the hall. And in this case, her most disturbing instincts prove reliable. A man has entered the house, a man who lives for one purpose, to satisfy all appetites as they arise, to immerse himself in sensation, to live without fear, remorse, or limits, to live with intensity. His name is Edgler Foreman Vess. He likes to make words from the letters of his name, God, Demon, Save, rage, anger, fear, forever, 
are just a few of them, and then make sentences of the words. One of his favorites, God fears me, is sometimes the last thing he whispers to his victims. Edgler Vess is a self-proclaimed homicidal adventurer. On this night, his adventure, murdering everyone in the house, becomes China's long nightmare. Trapped in Vess's deadly orbit, China thinks only of getting out alive. But when she inadvertently learns the identity of Vess's intended next victim, waiting for him far from the Napa Valley, China is gripped by concern for this other person, who is as innocent as China and as endangered. Driven now by a sense of responsibility for another, by a purpose and meaning beyond mere self-preservation, China rises to unexpected heights of courage and daring. Her only hope as the threat of Edgler Foreman Vest closes in and grows more horrifying moment by moment. So this book unfolds basically over a 24-hour span, um, which is which is pretty cool. I like I like that format. Um, it uh, it was a little dry at times. I found I found there was a little too much of our main character China reminiscing about her past. It was like. It was like she would she would tell you stories about when she grew up because her mom was a drug addict and she was always with different guys and trying to, you know, getting drunk and getting high. And so she wasn't the greatest parent, obviously, since she was exposed to a lot of bad things at a very young age. Um, obviously, they wanted to drill that point home for the plot of the story, but I found they kept going back to it a little too much. It was like, okay... Like we get it, we were recycling the same childhood memories over and over. And I just thought that kind of was the part that dragged on a little bit. I'd rather them just continue with the plot that was going on. Um, outside of that, overall, this um, this villain, I know I said in the last book, the villain was one of the most evil ever. This guy was pretty messed up as well. Like I said, it seems like it's a common theme for Dean Koontz villains to just be like max crazy or max like just, they, they really take it to another level basically. So she, she is stuck in a house where like he, he murders the whole family right off the hop and she ends up hiding under the bed. So he, he didn't know there was anyone else there. She then basically stowaways on his RV to get back to his place and ends up confronting him there um, to put a stop to, you know, his murdering ways and, and save um, a child who he had locked up in his basement. So uh, in a nutshell, that's basically the book. Like I said, it, it does drag a little bit at times, but overall, still a pretty good read. Um, out of the three that I've read from Dean Koontz, I would probably put this third on my list um, behind the first two that I just talked about in this video. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to getting to more Dean Koontz, and um, I still recommend this one for a hor the horror lover. Once again, thanks for checking out my video if you came this far. Um, I'm coming at you with uh, some more Stephen King videos coming up, which is the primary focus of my channel. Um, if you love reading, if you love Stephen King, as always, subscribe, give me a like, and we'll talk to you soon.